they discovered upon their arrival was almost unspeakable. We are all evil in some form or another. I'm not guilty. <laughs> the dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. Some, if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. Hello and welcome to the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. I'm Vicki. And I'm Janelle. And we're back again, coming to you live, not live, from our homes. <laughs> live right now, but not in the future. Now featuring better audio quality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apologies. I realized my input on the last episode was uh, not correct, so now it should sound better. But listen, we're human. We I still don't have a pop human. filter. I realized that I didn't have the pop filter when I listened to the, the last couple of episodes. <laughs> I was like, oofa doofa, my bad. <laughs> It's fine. Everything's fine. The, the I'm being not the positive one right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so if this is your first time listening, a special hello to you. Uh, we got another great episode for for y'all. For your ear holes. For your, <laughs> for your ear holes. <laughs> you said for all your holes. I was like, oh, no, ear oh holes. Boy. Oh, boy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we're just going to head over to the newsroom. <laughs> This week, our news comes from uh, the UK, where, uh, let's see, Sunderland, I think, David Lee, 40-year-old David Lee, pleaded guilty to... This is from the Manchester Evening News. Pleaded guilty to causing unnecessary suffering to a herring gull. Because could you could you even guess why? Um, I don't. Did he punch it? I don't know. <laughs> he was caught on CCTV carrying out a sex act in public. While holding a bird against his legs. Just like, just like holding it, not actively trying to like fuck a bird. Okay, so <laughs> basically they Please say, they see, him, <laughs> they see him at 1 a.m. chasing this bird down the road. And then they see him on a different camera chasing the same bird. And then they see him on a different camera. <laughs> he caught a bird, different mm-hmm. bird, smaller bird. Um... He goes down the road that he he, he basically um, places, he pulls. Yeah, you he, can't he, even he, describe it. Just, <laughs> Indescribable. I, it, because the, the logic of this just doesn't make any sense. He pulls his pants down um, to start masturbating with the bird close to his groin area while watching pornography. <laughs> What? <laughs> Which to me, I, I I know. See, this is why I'm like, what? Um, it says the defendant places the bird close to his groin and in between his legs. He goes back to his phone, continues with the act, and then says he pulls his trousers up and gives a kick to the bird, picks up the phone, and walks off. So <laughs> okay, okay. I don't know what's going on over there, but. Uh, Y'all are into some weird shit. Yeah. Not to kink shame. Yeah, but like, I mean, uh, that's beyond even <laughs> a kink, I think. <laughs> I know. Oh, my goodness. Um, Yeah, that is some shit. <laughs> it, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along to Netflix and Kill, where we are talking about a... Fictional series based on a true story that we have, in fact, covered on the show, actually, called The Watcher. Mm-hmm. Now, Janelle, if you remember, you actually covered this case. I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't watch a- it. <laughs> you did or you didn't? I did not because I did not want to taint my idea of the entire thing. I mean, it's really good. 
in it a weird. Okay. <laughs> it's it's kind of uh cheesy a little bit, but mm-hmm. like the people that are in it are like really good. And I think it does a really great job of like misleading you and pointing you in various directions and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um so there was an article uh in New York magazine um about this family who moved into a house and was receiving letters from the watcher. Like I said, we I don't remember when we covered that case, but I know you did at some mm-hmm. point. Yes, it was a while ago. <laughs> so the series is based on that. It's also created by Ryan Murphy, who is love me some Ryan Murphy, creator of uh, American Horror Story. Mm-hmm. Um, so the series follows a couple, they move into this home in New Jersey and they start getting harassed by this guy. Um, it's got, just to mention a few, Naomi Watts, Jennifer Coolidge, Margot Martindale, who I love, uh, Richard King, Mia Farrow, like Joe Mant- Mantello, mm-hmm. um, all these people. I loved, I love me some Jennifer Coolidge. <laughs> There's also this, uh, it's not in this article. Hold on one second. Because there is this other piece of it that is pulled in from somewhere. Um, There's like this murderer um, that part of it is, is based on. Let's see. I don't remember what it is, but... Uh, anyway, it's it's a really fun series if you're looking for something that isn't necessarily documentary, but, um, you know, based on a true story. Uh, it's it's very creepy, very mysterious, all sorts of. Uh, I don't know. Good stuff. I don't really have too much to say about it. It was just a fun series to watch. <laughs> <laughs> OK, maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll give it a go. I was looking. Sorry. I was looking for, I don't remember where I saw, there's this like guy who murders his whole family that is portrayed in this show as well as sort of a, like a misdirect. Um, anyway, good stuff. This is that part of the show where we say content may not be appropriate for our listeners. Um, we are going to be discussing some pretty, uh, pretty tough stuff, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that statement. <laughs> yeah. Um, and to be fair, I'm not even sure like where the inspiration for this episode came from. But we are talking about affairs gone horribly wrong. Uh-huh. Because I feel like anytime love or lust more likely is involved, like some shit is going to be going down. So I am going to be covering the murder of Jesse Valencia. So Jesse Valencia was born in 1981 in Boyle County, Kentucky. He was one of three children and his parents got divorced when he was just a baby. Although I did see that he had a stepfather that he became incredibly close with. After finishing high school, Valencia attended the University of Missouri, where he was studying pre-law and journalism. He had also, by this point in his life, come out as gay, something that it seemed to me like his family and his uh, friends were super supportive of. Like It it seemed like um, he had a really supportive community around him. But you're still talking about going to college as a gay man in... Like the early 90s. So not great. There's that. There's that. His family and his friends described him as outgoing and full of life. And he was planning on going to law school after college. Now, on the afternoon of June 5th, 2004, police received a phone call from some college students saying that they had discovered a body on the lawn. When they arrived on the scene, it was discovered to be that of 23-year-old Jesse Valencia. He was found wearing only a pair of boxer shorts. Um, His throat had been cut so deep that his spine had been nicked. Yeah. And there were apparently some bruises on his body. 
After further examination of his body, the medical examiner determined that the knife used had a serrated blade and he did not see any defensive wounds. Because of the lack of defensive wounds, investigators surmised Valencia had been strangled and was unconscious before his fatal wound. Now, Valencia lived just a block from where his body was discovered, and when authorities went to investigate the premises, they found that the door was open, although nothing had been taken, and it did not appear that there was any sort of like struggle or disturbance. Evidence was collected from Valencia's apartment as well as from his body and sent for testing. Meanwhile, police spoke with the neighbors who reported hearing an an argument coming from Valencia's apartment around 4 a.m. When the test came back, it was found that a used condom um, that they had sent contained DNA from both Valencia and a man named Ed McDevitt. The scrapings came back with DNA from the same and a third unknown individual. Police continued their investigation and managed to connect up with a friend of Valencia's, Andy Shermerhorn. Now, Shermerhorn told police that he and Valencia had been friends with benefits and had been meeting months earlier for um, occasional sex. And on one of these occasions, while the two were, you know, mid sexy time, there was a knock at the door. And when Valencia answered the door, Shermerhorn saw that it was a police officer in full uniform shining a light and entering the apartment. The officer encouraged the two to continue having sex. And, what? uh, yep. Sorry. What is happening yes. right now? Mm hmm. Valencia then told Shermerhorn that he knew the officer and invited him to join in the fun. And the three of them had sex and the officer left, emphasizing that no one could know about what happened. So all of a sudden, police are like, oh, uh, we might be looking for another police officer. Ooh, Again, how common is it for the call to be coming from inside of the house guys like i'm not saying i'm just saying (laughs) so a second person was able to corroborate this affair with a police officer and it happened to be valencia's own mother So she told police that Valencia had, in fact, mentioned that he was having a relationship with a police officer, but never mentioned his name. Um, He also felt that the officer might be stalking him and was becoming leery about the relationship because he really did not know a whole lot about this guy. So on the back of Shermerhorn's information to police, they had him come down to the police station to attempt to identify the officer in question. But while they were walking him down the hallway to the interview room, Shermerhorn was able to peep at all the officers as he was walking through the hallways. And by the time he made it to the interview room where a Columbia Police Department yearbook was waiting for him to identify photos, Shermerhorn said he didn't need it because he saw the officer while he was walking down the hallway. The man that he identified was 27-year-old Stephen Rios. By the time Shermerhorn identified him, Rios had been working at Columbia PD for around three years. Rios was married and had recently had a baby. Uh, His colleagues described Rios as, quote, well-liked and well-respected, but also that he was a pretty strict rule follower, although many noted his ambition uh, within the police department as well. So it really came as a complete shock to most of the officers that he could even possibly be involved in this in any, any way. What would come out after this is quite the unusual story. So Rios and Valencia first crossed paths just a few months before Valencia's murder when Rios responded to a noise complaint at a party that Valencia was attending. After getting into a verbal altercation with Rios, Valencia was arrested and given a municipal court summons for obstructing a government operation. (laughs) 
Now, according to Valencia's mother, Linda, Rios asked him numerous personal questions on the way to the police station. The following day, Rios randomly showed up at Valencia's apartment, claiming there were additional questions that he needed answered. So very early on, he was like actively pursuing Valencia in a very weird way. In the two months following Valencia's arrest, arrest, Rios and Valencia went out a couple of times, but most of their encounters would be Rios showing up to the apartment unannounced for sex. So authorities brought Rios in for questioning, where he vehemently denied any claims of a sexual relationship and denied any part in Valencia's murder. When they presented the witness testimony from Shermerhorn, Rios admitted that he was having a sexual relationship with Valencia, but continued to deny any involvement in his murder. Rios also agreed to provide authorities with a DNA sample, which was compared to the unknown profile under Valencia's fingernails. The results came back as a match. However, this did not necessarily confirm confirm his involvement and after further further questioning by police rios was allowed to leave which seems like an interesting choice in light of what happens afterwards so investigators decided to return to valencia's body to see if there was anything additional to glean when they noticed that the bruising across his chest and between his shoulder blades was in a pattern that sort of led the investigators to believe Valencia had been choked using a chokehold technique called unilateral vascular neck restraint. Sounds like a cop. Interesting, right? Uh, This is from uh, Talk Murder With Me, quote, a law enforcement trainer viewed Jesse's bruises and agreed that they may well have been the result of this type of restraint. But it was possible that the technique had not been administered properly and Jesse had fought whoever was trying to restrain him, causing more bruising, end quote. So they looked further into Rios's employment records and discovered that he had actually failed a defensive tactics course while he was training. So sounds like somebody who may not know how to do a proper chokehold. Yeah. Possibly. (laughs) Proper as choking someone can be. Yeah. um, Not to say that any chokehold should ever be used, but I mean, he didn't know how to do it right. (laughs) Um, When the medical examiners had gone back over Valencia's body uh, to look at the bruising, they had also discovered limb hair. So like arm hair. Mm -hmm. Weird way of putting it, but... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, limb hair. Um, that after DNA testing was confirmed to belong to Rios. So shortly after being released from questioning, Rios's boss, Captain Zim Schwartzy, received a call from Rios saying he had bought a shotgun and was threatening to kill himself. Somehow, Schwartzy managed to convince Rios to come back where he was taken into protective custody with a 96-hour hold at a mental health facility. Rios escapes from this facility. Again, like, unclear how exactly he just peaced out. And went to the roof of a parking garage where he was again threatening to kill himself. Mm-hmm. Authorities arrived on the scene and talked him down from a literal ledge And once again, Rios was placed back into the mental health facility. Rios was finally arrested and charged with first degree murder, although he has continued to maintain his innocence during all of this. Um, During trial, the prosecution revealed that there were approximately 45 minutes where Rios was unaccounted for on the night of Valencia's murder. Uh, Their theory of that night was... Rios showing up to Valencia's apartment unannounced, as he did. Um, Valencia then threatened to tell Rios's boss about his affair after finding out that Rios was actually married with a child. Mm. Valencia wanted to end the affair and uh, told Rios to leave him alone. But Rios was incredibly unhappy with this and became aggressive towards Valencia. Valencia then ran outside to try and get away, but Rios chased after him, grabbing him from behind and choking him with that special Special cop chokehold. 
After a short struggle, Valencia became unconscious, at which point Rio slit his throat and fled the scene. Any thoughts of how the defense might have tried to uh, present their case in this? Totally not gay. <laughs> well, they'd they, be like, um, he, how could he be gay? He has a family. You know, that old chestnut. Yes. <laughs> they, I mean, kind of. They pretty much tried to victim blame and paint Valencia as this sleazy gay man who slept around with anybody and everybody completely smearing his character. Mm -hmm. Like they're just like, why would we believe this gay guy who sleeps with everybody, which is the shittiest defense. I hate when that is like, yeah, like just a tad. It just, it makes me feel gross. Luckily the prosecution had science on their side. (laughs) Something the jury seemed to find value in, um, and they found Rios guilty of first-degree murder, sentencing him to life in prison without the possibility of parole in 2005. Now, upon appeal, Rios's uh, conviction was actually overturned by the Missouri Western District Court of Appeals in 2007 after they determined that statements made during trial were hearsay and inadmissible. So in 2020, which is an incredibly long time, uh, after a second trial, Rios was found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced again to life in prison plus 23 years for armed criminal action. Um, I believe with the second degree murder conviction, he is required to serve out a 30 year minimum plus the 23 years he has for armed uh, criminal action. So mm-hmm. he is currently in jail. Good. <laughs> prison. Um, but that is the murder of Jesse Valencia. All right, so we're going to take a look at a a very heterosexual relationship. (laughs) Oh, boring. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I'm going to cover the love triangle of Mark and Janair Gerardo and um, Meredith Chapman. Oh, boy. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. For a second, I thought we were going to be in France. I know. I had to like look up their name because I'm like, I know that's a French name, but maybe they don't pronounce it as such, but they do. <laughs> you know how some people bastardize other languages? <laughs> yeah, We're no. one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark and Janair Girardeau met as teens in the summer of 1986 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Janair and Mark were both uh, working at Taco Bell the summer of that year. They just kind of were co-workers, and then um, they both left Taco Bell uh, and started dating a little while after that and married, actually, a few years later in October of 1993. She was 23, and he was 25. Okay. Mark described their relationship as really loving with your typical just silly arguments, um, but In some interviews, he described it as occasionally there would be epic blowouts because Janair needed to have the last word. Mm, I know people like that. Interesting. (laughs) The two moved to South Carolina where he worked at a college in marketing. Janair was working in marketing as well at a separate um, business. And in 2017, Mark took a new job at the University of Delaware as the marketing director. Um, The couple was having some financial struggles and they kind of wanted a change of pace. Now, they kind of separated at this point because uh, Mark had to go start work immediately. So he moved up to the University of Delaware and lived in an apartment while Janair stayed behind in South Carolina to set up their previous home so that it could be a rental so that they would still be receiving some income from that. Sure. Sure. She then quit her job and found another position in marketing in Delaware. Now, while Janair was still in South Carolina, Mark was working and living alone. 
kind of a pseudo bachelor life. Okay. Mark worked under, which pardon the joke, um, Meredith Chapman <laughs> in the marketing oh department at the University of Delaware. No. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> had to oh God. had to work one joke in there. <laughs> Chapman was 33 years old, also married. She was married to uh, Newark City Councilman Luke Chapman. She was 15 younger than Mark and in charge of the whole department. She actually um, also ran for Delaware Senate in 2016. So, you know, she was in a political family, unfortunately a Republican. Um, <laughs> so sorry for her. Um, <laughs> So, you know, in this very political headspace, we're getting marketing, working in a university, academia, all that fun stuff. And the two um, would have working lunches because um, I don't know if you've ever worked in a university before, but there's a lot of working lunches. There's a lot of you eat salad in front of somebody while you keep working. It's interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> I know that life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Now, these lunches uh, eventually turned into dinners, and the two shared their unhappiness in their own marriages um, and kind of opened up to each other. And within four weeks of Mark moving to Newark, Delaware, uh, Meredith and him shared their first kiss. So here comes the love triangle. (laughs) Saucy. (laughs) Yeah. Soon after their first kiss, um, Mark decided to interview for another position. So he was kind of like not having second thoughts, but definitely knew he was guilty of doing, you know, the adultery thing. Sure. And so he went and interviewed at a position at a university in Colorado. Um, But once he got there, he decided against pursuing the job further. And while he was away, he decided that he wanted to continue to be with Chapman. Um, Around this time, as he was coming back from Colorado, Janair came to live in Delaware with him, and she immediately felt like something was wrong. Um, This is from an interview he did with Dr. Oz, I believe. Uh, He said, she finally asked me, what's up with you? You're acting different. And then she said, specifically, it's Meredith, isn't it? So he had been talking about his job and, you know, in true fashion, kind of, you know, called his own bluff and like was talking about this Meredith girl more yeah. than would be comfortable. <laughs> so Mark announced his intent to leave his wife, Janair, but still entered counseling with her. So kind of doing this sort of flip flopping. He also continued to see Meredith. Uh, Meredith, uh, once they started kind of seeing each other more and he was telling her, you know, very typical love triangle stuff, telling her that he was going to leave his wife. Um, but then also like telling his wife, everything was fine and going to counseling with his wife. She decided Uh, because pro tip, don't date married people. (laughs) Yeah. Pro tip. Don't cheat on your spouse. (laughs) Also that. Yeah. Also that. Um, (laughs) so Meredith decided that you know, since they were seeing each other, it probably wouldn't be good to continue to work together. So she quit her job at the University of Delaware, uh, moved to Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and started working at Villanova University. And then she separated from her husband. So her and her husband had only been together for nine years, whereas Mark and Janera were together for a few decades. <laughs> right. Um, so for her, it was like no love lost. And if you're married to someone who's in politics, you don't really see them very much anyway. So I'm sure she yeah. was kind of like, bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was basically playing both of them full tilt at this time. The knowledge of the affair um, Mark had with Meredith was really making Janair upset and she started acting out. Now, this is where it gets a little bit twisted. She started tracking his whereabouts, even going to the extent of putting a tracking device on his car. Mm. She became convinced that he was going to leave her since Meredith was separating from her husband. You know, she had moved to Pennsylvania. She filed for divorce. She started a new job. So she was kind of like not even in the state. But somehow, um, Janair disguised herself and placed a tracking device on Meredith's car. Oh, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Janair then proceeded to sew recording devices into Mark's clothing so that she could pick up any conversation between them about a plan to leave her. 
Oh my god. This is the point where I say, honey, you need to leave him. Leave him, leave him, yes. leave him. Fucking leave him. <laughs> yeah. That, oh my god, yeah. yeah. Now, the recordings were released by Mark to the detectives um, investigating the case. And there was an excerpt that was in an article that I wanted to share because it was just like really, really fucking sad. Quote, you don't find me appealing. You don't find me attractive. You don't want me anymore. You don't even like me. You're miserable. So this was a recording of her talking to Mark, and that's what she said to him. So you can kind of see she's extremely upset and, mm -hmm. like, basically breaking down. Right. Janera then proceeded to get hacking software to hack into Mark's phone and his computer. She uncovered over 400 messages on Snapchat between Mark and Meredith. I'm just like, like uh, this is cringe. Like, this is so cringe. I can't. Yeah. Um, it's so cringy. Yeah. Um, they proceeded to attend the counseling services. But during one of those sessions, Janair revealed that she felt Mark was tossing her away for someone younger and shiny and new. And at the mm. end of the session is where Mark found the recording device sewn into his jacket. He went to put on oh his coat. Oh, my God. And it was in the lining of his jacket. So, like, during a right, counseling. As they were leaving. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, I guess if you're going to find it, that's a good place to find it at. Let's talk about your trust issues. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have somebody to, like, counsel you through conflict resolution. Yeah. When he confronted Janair, she told him that she wanted to know if he was planning on leaving her. And so that's why she has all these recording devices. She then revealed that she was tracking his whereabouts and had evidence of his messages to Meredith. So she spilled the entire beans on herself and was like, I put recording devices in your jacket. I know where you're all at all times. I know your phone. You know, I know how to get into your phone. I am tracking your car. I know what you're doing. And it was then that he stated that he wanted to separate from her and not continue counsel. Mm, fair enough. <laughs> on April 23rd, 2018, Mark was set to meet Janair for dinner that evening. Um, Janair contacted him and stated hi to him that she had made a wrong turn and was going to be late because at this time, Mark had officially moved to Philadelphia. Okay. The next message she texted was, I'm not coming, just go home. The two continued oh. to exchange messages, and Mark was eager to meet with her because they needed to discuss their imminent divorce. Um, mm -hmm. They proceeded to argue via text message with each other, Janair saying, you ruined my life and I hope you never find happiness. And then finally concluding the exchanges with, bye, Mark. I said it in my head, like, bye, Mark. <laughs> I always, any time, I mean, I feel like the room has ruined it for me, but I always, anytime I see Mark, I'm like, oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> Bye, Mark. Now, Mark then proceeded to text Meredith to say that he was going to be heading her way, but she did not respond to him and he really began to worry. And also, Janair was not responding to him at all either. So he's like, oh my Ooh. God, what if something's happening? Oh, no. So he drove as fast as he could to Meredith's apartment. Now, Janair Gerdo disguised herself by donning a wig and took a train from Delaware to Radnor. This is where Chapman was living. She Homegirl was just like ready with the disguises. Yes. She broke into Meredith's home, cleaned up the glass that she had to bust through to get in there, um, and then laid in wait, basically. Around 7 p.m., Meredith Chapman returned home, and Janair popped out, surprising her, and shot and killed her. Janair then turned the gun on herself. <gasps> oh, no. So, sorry with the murder suicides, guys. <laughs> Yo, hitting us with a twofer. I know. Mark called the police and raced to meet Meredith at her apartment. Um, he thought, as he was going over there, because they were not responding, he thought that there was, gonna, like, a fight. Like, she was going to confront her and, like, you know, just be overall out of control. Yeah. But when he arrived, the police had just pulled in and up to the door and walked in. And he stated that his new girlfriend was in there and possibly his ex-wife. And upon entry, the police let him know that there were two bodies of two women in the complex. And oh. he just freaked the fuck out. In texts and emails later taken from Janair's computer and phone, it appears that she had been planning this ambush and murder for weeks. 
Even some of the info suggested that she intended to shoot Mark if he arrived first. So she basically, like, wrote out a plan. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, Now, after Meredith's death, her ex-husband, Luke, received two life insurance payouts. This is like a weird side story that happened. He was still listed as sole beneficiary on her policies as they had just started divorce proceedings and he hadn't been removed yet. Mm -hmm. Now, Meredith Chapman's mother and her siblings argued that Luke Chapman was not entitled to the insurance proceeds, even though the policies were issued in Delaware, because she had moved to Pennsylvania shortly before her death. So they were trying to kind of subjugate him and remove him essentially from it by saying that she was no longer in Delaware. He was the ex-husband. She had moved to Pennsylvania. Like, there's no reason that he should get this money. Right. Now, here's some weird law stuff. (laughs) Under Pennsylvania's revocation upon divorce law, the former spouse of a life insurance policyholder is deemed to have predeceased the policyholder for beneficiary purposes and is not entitled to any proceeds. Okay, so basically that's saying he shouldn't get the money. Mm -hmm. The law is based on the presumption that a policyholder who who names a spouse as beneficiary then is divorced and dies without having changed the beneficiary um nonetheless intended to remove the ex-spouse as beneficiary sure i mean that makes sense right to me. yeah so delaware law also has a revocation upon divorce provision but unlike pennsylvania's law which applies to both wills and insurance policies delaware's law only impl- applies to wills that's kind of interesting because i feel like it the is. insurance policy or the insurance industry would have pushed to have that also apply to them because that that would also mean less payouts like we're surprisingly has really weird laws there's also some like shell company issues out of delaware too like there's some weird well we had talked about that in um during that life insurance scam with Mm -hmm. the um that one guy because they it was like primarily in florida but they had set up in delaware i think exactly so delaware has a lot of like weird little loopholes and things so i'm not too surprised but Mm -hmm. If you want to commit some crimes, go to Delaware, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> now, Luke Ch- Chapman argued in a court petition that because the divorce decree was issued in Delaware and because the insurance policies were issued in Delaware, Delaware law governs the disposition of the insurance proceeds and he is the proper recipient. So because it doesn't apply to life insurance policies and only wills, he's like, it doesn't matter that she doesn't live here anymore. Everything happened in Delaware. Okay. Now, Chapman kind of one but kind of not one (laughs) okay so she had a life insurance policy from the university of delaware where she worked which um the insurer was also a delaware resident the other other life insurance policy that she had was through a private company in delaware but the quote unquote like insurer the person who owns it was not in delaware so What happened basically was the University of Delaware with the Delaware insurer gave him the money because it fell completely under Delaware law, Mm -hmm. whereas the other one, they said, stated, fell under Pennsylvania law. (laughs) So he only got one of the two life insurance policies. Sure. This is a very, I don't want to say very common, but like, when you're talking litigation, like this kind of figuring out what applies where is super common. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very complex when people also when yeah. people are like going over state lines and things like mm-hmm. that. And then like divorces yeah. are really complex. It's like a whole thing. Yeah, And when you're talking about businesses and where to serve people and do mm-hmm. I mean, there's whole classes on this sh- on this shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, Mark. Oh, Mark, Mark, Mark. OK. I don't know how I feel about this gentleman because of the things that he did after the death of his wife and his lover. Uh Uh-oh. Mark decided to do a bunch of press on various shows about the death of his wife and his lover. And in these interviews, he goes on to state like he's so, 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 so sorry about hurting both of these women. And oh, what could he have done differently? And not all cheat of these- on your fucking wife. Don't <laughs> cheat on your wife or just like get a divorce right away. Like, hello. Right. <laughs> right. 
what could I have done differently? Oh, yeah. my God. So some okay. of the things that he did, he went on a podcast called Dr. Romani. He went on Dr. Oz. He went on 2020. Ugh. He, like, did this full court press circuit bullshit. And it appeared to me like he really, like, loved the attention he was getting and loved talking about his story. So much so that he eventually wrote a fucking book. The book is called Irreparable. Three lives, two deaths, one story that has to be told. It's just, it's can, so I, bad. I, I keep forgetting you can't see my face. I'm just yeah. like cringing. <laughs> like it's all. Now, so... I did not read this book because I have very mixed feelings about this gentleman. Yeah. And I didn't want to give him the money because this was like a self-publishing situation. Yeah. It just feels very, very strange and super duper fucking icky. The whole thing with him, like, doing all of these interviews and writing a book. And it appears to me, like, from reading all this stuff, that he was just trying to have both of these women for as long as he possibly could. And, you know, it's like a full-blown have-your-cake-eat-it-too situation. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately for him, it turned out the worst way possible. The worst outcome possible. But it really feels like he was kind of milking it a little bit. I don't want to, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it's super or anything. Did you watch any of these interviews that he did? I did. I watched the 2020 interview and I read the article that came out after he was on Dr. Oz and the transcripts from the Dr. Ramini show. Yeah. And I think I'm curious if like, I mean, I would not expect this of Dr. Oz because he's a piece of shit. mm -hmm. Um, But like 2020, I would, hope that they would sort of hold his feet to the fire a little bit as yeah. far as yeah. his responsibility in all of this. Yes. I mean, you would think, but I have watched 2020s where I was like, oh, God. Oh, honey, no. I like, know. <laughs> you know. Sometimes it's just like the softball, like. Yeah. Now, I'm pretty sure also Dr. Romani knows Dr. Oz, and they're both kind of like sketchy quote unquote doctors if i'm not mistaken i think that's the same guy yeah there's snake oil sales yeah so those two like that if he would just went on 2020 and was like interviewed by newspapers i'd be like okay um Mm -hmm. maybe even i'd be like oprah okay yeah sure if he talked to oprah or something but the fact that he went to dr oz and dr romani is what really kind of weirded me out about the whole thing and then on top of that he writes a book and the title is just like woe is me basically yeah well and that's why i was curious like what sort of uh like responsibility he was taking because obviously Mm -hmm. as the only person left in this horrible tragedy really you know he is able to control the narrative to a certain extent right right um and i i mean it's tricky because i'm not saying that he deserved to have the people close to him die right Mm -hmm. that is not what i am getting at at all yeah but at the same time you can't go through this and not acknowledge that you know had his choices been better Mm -hmm. (laughs) that maybe there would not have been this at least love triangle while he was still married i mean that's not i mean it's tricky because his wife seems so unstable yeah there towards the end too Mm -hmm. but like I do think he bears some responsibility for, like, this going so far. For sure. Yeah. So, like, he has an obvious motive to, like, go on all of these um, talk shows Mm -hmm. and write a book and do these interviews to, like, come out as less of the bad guy, less skeezy, right? For, like, having a fucking affair in the first place and not just getting divorced as Mm -hmm. regular people do. Exactly. Yep. (sighs) It drives me crazy. I think the idea of affairs just drives me crazy because I'm like, just get a fucking divorce. Right. Why? Right. Get a divorce. I don't know. I just, uh, I don't, even just getting separated temporarily or being like, maybe try the conversation about it. Let's have an open marriage. You know, there are so many steps you could do before you do the affair. (laughs) Literally. And like, I would feel i feel like somebody who gets a divorce and then starts seeing other people versus having a fucking affair is way less of a scumbag 
like <laughs> yeah. just cheating on your fucking spouse. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Once you do that, you cross into the line of scumbaggery that I am <laughs> not OK with, you know, yeah. <laughs> men and women. I'm not there's no discrimination. Like, mm-hmm. don't fucking cheat mm-hmm. on your spouse, on your partner or your spouse or whatever. Just mm-hmm. don't fucking do it. Yeah, it's really not that hard. Says the person who's perpetually single. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, if it is that hard for you, then don't get married. Yeah, right. And right. don't have a Marriage committed relationship. not for you. Yeah, just don't do it. It's that's yeah. okay too. You don't have to or, get married. Or find some somebody who's like totally fine with a polyamorous relationship, exactly. right? Like there's so many options, people. There are so <laughs> many options. There's so anyway. many options. Don't you don't have to cheat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Anyway. Good time. Was there did you have more <laughs> nope. to know? That's it. That was so <laughs> that was I kind story. of went, on a, went off on a t- tangent about affairs. That's okay. <laughs> but I didn't you're the one who picked to. this so i feel like you're very passionate <laughs> <laughs> sure true i think i've been having a lot of conversations with uh one of the women i work with is like into um these sort of romancy type novels mm-hmm. and a lot of times they start with some sort of affair and she's Board like i just don't yep. get it i never yep. get it <laughs> oh your boring marriage oh the lusty lustiness oh Ugh. someone new except if you think about it like is it really that better no no it's not you just think it is because it's different different isn't always better (laughs) (laughs) different is just different (laughs) yeah exactly well before you decide to have an affair don't (laughs) go see a counselor and then listen to this (laughs) listen to this podcast (laughs) murder road trip is a true crime podcast where i your host Haley, discuss murder cases in my car aka the mobile beats lab join me and my partner in crime hh gnomes on the road there will be games mixtapes and snacks as i make the research journey to murder scenes around the world make sure to check your back seat and i'll see you at the next rest stop Oh my goodness that has been our episode this week that's a sh- I, honestly this one is kind of a shorty episode i know tiff is yeah. gonna message me and be like why is your audio so short that's okay though you know what it makes up for all the times that we've almost pushed a two-hour mark <laughs> yeah yeah um frankly sometimes you just need an amuse bouche mm-hmm. yeah you need a little appetizer appetize and <laughs> some horse divorce yeah horse divorce <laughs> instead oh. of cheating Horse divorce. <laughs> Horse divorce. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, well, we don't really have any updates at the moment. I mean, we got that show coming up, but like... November. It's a long ways away. <laughs> yeah. And we don't really have any information. Enjoy so just, the summer. God damn it. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Enjoy the summer. We are rolling into summer. Get outside. Yeah. Take breathe a walk. some fresh air. I'll be, unfortunately, changed to my studio, but... With the windows open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Um, do you have anything you want to end, end with um, before we close? No. Okay, I don't. Cool. I, we'll really, move. I don't. All right. Well, on that note, our sound and editing is by Tiff Fullman. Our music is by Jason Sashevsky. Do your enigma. This has been the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. We will see you in two weeks. Uh, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. It was as if a wave of evil washed over this town. We are all people in some form or another.